Today I'm with a man who wears a lot of hats. Some hats that are just, just he's Subir Saran and he is a brand and a name and everything comes with that name. Subir Saran is the man who brought Indian cuisine to the West and made it what it is today. He is the first ever Indian restaurateur to get a Michelin star and he's an author, he's a world famous um, <laughs> food uh, you know, critic and blogger. I'm a human being. And you're, you're just the man with the best opinions and <laughs> uh, I don't know where to start and where to end. You've said too much already, so let's start talking. So, Savir, let's talk about food and love. Food and love. I think love we all live for and food gives us the ability to live. What more needs to be said about food and love? What was the first journey that you took that, you know, was the stepping stone in your life? So the first journey I took was to leave Bombay and go to New York. And that journey began for love. I had a lover who lived in Paris and I lived in Mumbai. And for us to be lovers, we thought New York would be the place where we could be together. I lived my end of the bargain and I arrived in New York. He couldn't make it for many months. And when he did, he came to tell me that, oh, sorry, it doesn't seem to be working. So that was the first journey. So love, food and life are all very intertwined. And it was the first journey I undertook. Were you heartbroken? Was I heartbroken? I would be uh, dishonest in saying I wasn't. See, I almost am welling up with tears right now. But our first love, no matter how bad it is, is our first love. And, but what I got in the bargain was a romance in Manhattan, the greatest city in the world. The, I've made some of the most incredible friends, like your aunt Ritu Thaman, Dr. Thaman, and many others. And those people, they opened doors for me of opportunities, of love, of life, and love. And I would never trade that for anything. So would you say that because of that heartbreak that led you to work hard and become who you are today? So I think everything in our lives happens for a reason. Was it the heartbreak that made me work hard? Was it India that taught me to work hard? Was it my family that instilled some values that were um, uh, grounded in reality? I think it was all of them. And most of all, it was, I knew I was one little speck on the map of Manhattan. And for me to be uh, somebody to myself, I had to live, love, laugh, and most of all, work hard. So that if I felt I mattered, the world would perhaps see me as that speck. So I think I just uh, persevered and uh, did my best and left everything else to the uh, puppeteers that make our lives function and that's what the story was. So you believe in destiny? I'm not sure I believe in destiny. I believe that we can only control what we do and the rest is case sarasara. No, there must be something. I mean that, you know, the heartbreak was destined and that's what brought you to New York and then that's what brought you to Indian culinary experiences which you then, you know, spread to the world? So my uh, first love was a man called Robert Parker. Robert was a gallerist at the Louvre. At that point, he, wo he worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art where I started working in Manhattan. And uh, I always wrote Robert a message, even when we weren't chatting with one another, thanking him for every good thing that happened in Manhattan. I would jot Robert Parker a note and put it in the mail. And I would thank him for having loved me so I moved to New York so that good things happened and I would send him a letter. That's very romantic. So I think um, every step in our journey is an essential step because if we are going upwards or we think we're going upwards or forward however we look at it I think forward is a better way to say it. Um, where we were in the past where we were behind before being forward that matters so I think good or bad everything we do all our experiences all our stories all our chapters in the sum of them is the magic, not in the minutiae of the good or the destruction of the bad. I think in the sum total of all our experiences 
is the magic of life. And if you believe in that, ev destiny isn't the word I would use, it's living. That every moment that we live is a moment that is a blessing. And if we are so hungrily accepting of all the good that comes our way, if we are greedy about um, grabbing the good, we must show at least that much strength in dealing with the bad that comes our way. So we shouldn't chase love. <laughs> Should we, we shouldn't chase love. I think uh, to love is to live and to live is to love. So you must chase love. Yeah, no matter how many times you get your heart broken. You don't get your heart broken, you get your heart fed. And broken, we're all broken. We're all be, we'll always be broken. That's the beauty, those little blemishes, the little tears, the little rips, the little cracks in our heart, in our personality, in our lives. The way we look at them, the way we uh, dream, the way we think, the way we aspire, the way we uh, carry on with life, it's that golden glue that uh, fills them up and makes them sparkle and in their, again in their totality makes us shine brighter. So uh, we must love, we must never be broken if the other doesn't return our love. That's theirs to do, what is in our hands is our ability to love. So if you feel love for somebody, show it, share it and feel it. If they don't return it back, don't be broken because that's not in your hands. We can love, we can't force another to love us back. That's true. So unrequited love, what's your best advice for people it's who amazing. are... It's amazing. Unrequited love is the mother of all invention, is the uh, mother of all beautiful poetry, incredible art, that is a true. sense of style, great fashion, incredible poetry, uh, beautiful sounds of plaintive singing all come from unrequited who love. Who are some famous unrequited lovers who have uh, produced brilliant artworks of any kind, even food? Van Gogh, one of them. Um, uh, Sylvia Plath, an incredible writer. Um, I think those Mangeshkar sisters never found love, I'm told. So whether it's Asha Bhosle or Lata Mangeshkar, uh, these were broken women and uh, artists who've loved perhaps but not found it back. And look at the amazing music they produced. Yeah. So I think Rekha, this actress that I'm told, <laughs> loved and loved and loved but never got it back. So. Uh, the stories abound. <laughs> yeah. I think we all uh, have had unrequited love, but some of us aren't broken by it, but we channel the energy from it to do better for the sake of the world, for the sake of our love. Our love shouldn't die because of another not giving us that love back. You love to give it to the universe and the person you love, and then you've done your job. Now you lay back and enjoy. The fruits of it can be love coming your way, or it can be that in energy which said no, no don't, not needed, you put that energy into creations that are gifts you're giving that lover that doesn't listen to you. Let that be a work they like or not, but you've done it with their in, uh, love as the intention. It's our intention that's in our hands. The intentions of another we can't manage. The sooner we learn that, the happier we can smile despite being unrequited in our love. But we still go back to those who hurt us. If you are uh, a sadomasochist, perhaps, <laughs> uh, or you uh, love and you long and then you forget and life happens and you move on. Am I crying for Robert today? I'm not. But I'm still grateful that I fell in love with him. I got to New York. I did many things. I met him 20 years or so after he had broken my heart. And we had the best time together in Paris. I was with my lover uh, of uh, 15 years. And we, three of us, we traveled through the streets of Paris like three incredible people having a lot of fun. So that is the human heart and brain. They're elastic, they're forgiving, they're kind, they're generous, they grow, they evolve. We have to live with life and there's no unrequited love. There's fulfilling love. That's beautiful. So I want to talk to you about globalization when it comes to love because you had a French lover and, um, you know, food binds us, love binds us, art binds us. But today there is talk that globalization is too, too, it's ingrained in us to, to an extent that we're not self-sufficient anymore. So how would you say that globalization can be reimagined? I think it's being challenged every day. 
I don't think we need to reimagine it. We need to believe in globalization. What we are seeing around the world, from France to America to India to uh, every part, every corner of the world, China, Russia, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, name the country, Pakistan, wherever you turn today, there are uh, uh, people, politicals, and actors and characters that are allowing the worst of human instincts to break us apart, to tear us apart, to make us think small and insular, to make us uh, be smaller than our brain and mind want us to be. Why? Because those are comforting ways for others to make us so that they can then use the goat, use the sheep inside us to manipulate us to do the uh, outcomes that benefit them for either profit or for personal gain or for political gain. So if we are goats, goats are very, they challenge their uh, keepers. Sheep give themselves up to their keepers. So we humans should be more like goats, less like sheep. And globalization, of course, our Sufi saints, our Hindu gods and goddesses, our uh, oldest scripts like the Vedas, Vasudevaya Kutumbakam, I'm very glad that Prime Minister Modi has made that the calling card for G20 summit, Vasudevaya Kutumbakam. It says global, one world, global village, one people, one life. How much grander can Hinduism be? There is no other. So I thank Prime Minister Modi for making that the mantra of the G20. In all we are one, in many we are one, and the whole world is one village, one family. So that's what I think about globalization. We are all one. We're all one. And that, like, that ties to your spiritual belief as well? On I'm map. as Hindu as they get because in being Hindu, I'm not tethered to a book. I'm not tethered to a philosophy. I'm not tethered to a god. I'm not tethered to a, a code or conduct. I'm free. I'm a human who sees humanity in all others and respects the humanity in the others uh, vociferously as I uh, value my own. I see it in a, a bee and a butterfly and I respect the rocks and the mountains. That's the most beautiful thing Hinduism gifted the world. A philosophy that respects nature, uh, uh, beings, animate, and also those creatures that are inanimate equally. And that is what I believe in. And that's what you tell everyone who thinks that you're of another culture, although you're Indian. So I've been considered the other all my life. I arrived in New York in 1993 with long hair, curly hair that I'd permed. And I look like an Italian... Um, supernova superstar <laughs> for some reason and they thought I was a rock star I was a everything but an Indian student come to India they would talk to me in every language but Hindi and Urdu because they thought I was a foreigner so I've always been the other I was gay in a straight world I was brown in a white man's world I was Hindu around Christians I was considered Muslim around Hindus I've always been the other so uh, I don't have any problems with it but I challenge people to treat me with respect despite being the other, because we are all humans. You know, Sina Basina, when we talk heart to heart, there is no difference. So being Indian, you, brought, you were brought up here. We went to the same school, although that was many <laughs> years. Decades apart. Decades apart. But we have a similar educational upbringing in the same city, same school. But you hated Delhi growing up. And you came back from New York, and I, I think you said that you fell in love with it. I never hated Delhi. Delhi was my city. Delhi was a... In, I could never change anything about my childhood. I was such a fortunate, lucky boy to go to modern school, to have the teachers I had at modern school. Each one of them, too many to name. But if you're watching me, I'm grateful to all of you. Every minute at modern school in Vasant Vihar, Delhi, in the 80s and 90s, was magical. Those teachers, our principals, the, uh, the people who worked for our benefit as assistants to the teachers, the gardeners, the ayahs, the uh, chokidars, the bus drivers, the uh, people who just smiled looking at us in hallways because they were there for some reason. They made this kid who was gay living in a world that didn't, I didn't have any idols. My teachers, our employees of the school, they gave me a warm welcome every day. They I couldn't knew? hate them. They, whether they knew or not, they gave me love. And in, a, in my mind, I was the other. I was abhorrent. I was wrong. I was created different. I hated myself, but those teachers, those employees of modern school, they made me think I belong. 
because they smiled despite me thinking I'm broken, terrible, wrong, aberration. They made me think I, w I belonged. So I, d I couldn't hate Delhi for that reason. My family, my parents, they, my father was a bureaucrat. We were an average middle class family growing up in a poor country. What did we have? We had education. We had hopes and dreams and aspirations. And my parents gave me every ability to smile. I, you know, as a boy growing up in Delhi, my brother played cricket and football and hockey. What did I want to do? Knit, crochet, macrame, uh, tie-dye, uh, uh, do uh, uh, pottery, do painting, sing. I did every, I challenged them in every way. They never said a ladko clay, ladki clay, none of that. To them, anything I wanted to do was a dream they needed to work on realizing. I wanted to play tennis, not cricket, football and uh, hockey. They took me to the tennis courts at Gymkhana. So my parents made anything that I wanted. They worked hard as parents to give us that. I had, again, no reason to hate. Society of 1980s and 90s in Delhi was very um, aspirational. We were connecting to the world. We had poverty, but we had ideas. We had uh, uh, struggles, but we had dreams that were being realized. We had uh, challenges, we had uh, sectarian uh, divides, but we were healing them, we were working hard to fix them. We would speak in each other's language. I know a song in almost every Indian language. Uh, I can sing Assamese ganas, I can sing Tamil songs, I can sing in Urdu, I can sing in Hindi, I can sing in English, in Bangla. So, you know, this was the India I grew up in and we valued each other. I can't hate India, but I romance India. But when you came back India. from uh, New York, was there any difference, a major difference that you saw? I, when I lived in New York starting 1993, uh, 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 I left an India that was in 1980s. My fantasy India lived in the 80s. When I arrived back to Delhi in uh, the year 2000, uh, 2020, that Delhi was very different. It was a young nation full of muscle and bravado and machismo and uh, bluster and noise and telling the world we exist and we can break the heck out of you. It's a brave country. It's a country that's arrived. It's now no more a third world nation. We are a nation ready to become a leader of the world. So it's a very different muscular uh, country. And that was a challenge to me. Because I love this India that's Ma Bharati. Ma Bharati is a mother. What is a mother? A mother is gentle, kind, generous, loving, decent, graceful, elegant, forgiving. It's everything that's very beautiful about our emotions the mother has and mothers have strength and they cope with all the challenges of life. That's the India I left and what I found here was an India which was equal parts Ma Bharati and Ravan because we had become so big and we were becoming like America. America is a Ravan nation. <laughs> so macho and muscular that you say, oh my God, it's a bully in school. I look at America as a bully and India is now becoming some of it but I think that's the teething, that's the growing uh, challenges. All young boys want to become muscular, dole, shole banane, akhade mein jana hai, wrestling karni hai, mukkai marne. So, but then when you grow up and become a father, you realize, oh my God, I have to be civilized. So, we are going through the American phase. We've forgotten the Ma Bharati. We are trying to become one with the Rakshas that ex exists in all of us. But I think very soon we'll still grow up to be an elegant version of Mahabharati that is very 21st century and also as old as ancient India. So hospitality in New York and Delhi, what's the major difference? Because you know when we have guests, we treat them like God. So Atiti Devabhav, you know when a, 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 a guest walks into your home, um, God arrives with them, that diktat, nobody does better than India. The Oberoi Hotel, the Taj, the Leela, these hotels, um, the Neem Rana group of hotels, no matter which hotel group you go to, what they have better than so many other hotel groups of the world is an intrinsic um, brilliance in hospitality that other cultures can hire people to do but never bring out. We Indians, no matter how much people tear us apart into isms, into uh, uh, divides, in our hearts, we've grown up in a culture that's very reverential about the humanity of the other. So we serve, we welcome, we share, we respect one another rather holistically. And we are still at a point where we can save us from being destroyed because we are actually deeply good human beings, we Indians. So I think our, our hospitality is, uh, can, can't be compared to anybody. 
we really believe in being hospitable and that shines bright even in the worst of our times so i think that's the gift india has that no other country country has our poor as poor as they are they're the poorest of the world but you can be dressed like you and i are with flashy baubles diamonds and all the other precious stones in gold and platinum and silver and our poor who are naked and broken will smile and say namaste hello how are you kaise hain aap and with a smile that humanity doesn't exist in the world in other places you'll be shot dead they'll steal your jewels they'll kick you while you're dead and take away every bit of your uh, bodily and material wealth our indian brothers and sisters who are poor who we forgotten and neglected don't do that to us that's the beauty and bane of india that is so true very we're full of soul they are full of soul we are we all are, of us we are yeah. no but are poor are yeah. it's very easy to be soulful when you have all the creature comforts when you're sitting on a chair somebody is feeding you food giving you something to drink it's easy to be soulful but when you're poor when the world has forgotten you when the world hasn't given you a roof over your head when you live in the elements exposed naked and you're still smiling that is a person who should be broken in their soul but if they have a soul what a magnificent human being they are that is india we do have souls magical souls and who do you think is uh, bringing these souls to the forefront and doing something for them i hope a lot of i think that's what i see losing but when i go traveling across india i still see all these smiling creatures who are humans they're not creatures and when they smile despite being broken with those beautiful eyes that are covered with mud the body they still shine bright and they are hopeful they have aspiration they have dreams they're connected to the world are poor maybe illiterate but they are smart they know about the world who is connecting them i don't have the answers but i know that they look at the world as a global village vasudevaya kutumbakam that whole um, prime minister modi's uh, uh, message to g20 our indian villages are living and i think it's a beautiful message he shared with the world that vasudevaya kutumbakam we are one village so our people i don't know who's helping them i think they help themselves by having large hearts very big brain and visions and by being uh, people who are more forgiving and uh, uh, generous than you and i who have had every creature comfort so they are protecting themselves they are helping themselves and they are gifting themselves a gift of honest life and living by doing what they do we have to learn from them not the other way around so any dinner table conversations that you would like to share some of the most interesting ones you've ever had the interesting ones are the ones where i'm shocked educated men and women voting against their rights educated men and women with all the coiffed hair and jewels you know lost in just the material uh, wealth of their uh, uh, belongings and not seeing the world for what it is those are the interesting ones because they are they happen more often than i want to but that's where they are beautiful that they destroy they are destructive people who have too much wealth they are creatures of comfort with madness in their hearts and souls so we have a lot of that happening all over the world today but the best dinner table conversations i have are the conversations where i celebrate the poor men and women of india who have big hearts big souls grand vision and a dignity of humanity that we can all learn a lot from and i never stop from sharing those stories because our aam aadmi can give us so much uh, knowledge and strength that all of us should lose a little in material wealth and become like the indian aam aadmi and the day we do that we'll be a nation of healers and not stealers so i think that's the important thing we can do so some people believe that food is political do you think food can also be sensual like an aphrodisiac but for bringing the senses of the or the, of the masses together so when you eat it should be a party of the senses a party that celebrates every sense of humanity of human uh, conditioning of human pleasure of human aspirations so you first eat with your eyes so the food you cook should be beautiful it should be sourced from beautiful places so in your mind you should think where is this food coming from is it coming from organic farms from natural farms from uh, farmers who are well fed and well respected 
Think about that. Buy, shop correctly. So when you do that, you'll sleep better at night and your food will digest better. After we've seen it, we touch it. The temperature should be correct. The textures should be correct. Invest in that. Then we put it in our mouths. Then the smell first hits us. So make sure it smells good. Then the taste. It should be hot, sour, salty, sweet, acidic, bitter. And then we start digesting it. And the texture of it matters again. And if it's whole, if it's full, if it's clean and correct, it digests easily and doesn't sit heavy in your stomach. So I think like good sex, good food is all about all these pleasures coming to the table correctly and fully and wholeheartedly. So you are what you eat and you are what you love. So do it correctly. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was um, unexpected, but... Why unexpected? We're the land of Kama Sutra. How can you be shocked by that? Not shocked by that at all. So what do you think of the new Modi documentary? Well, it's not a new Modi documentary. It's an old documentary. What happened in this documentary happened long time ago. The Supreme Court made its verdict. The Prime Minister was acquitted. The BBC has made a documentary. Let it be. Uh, India is too strong, too bold, too uh, wise to worry about noises being made by channels across the world about things of the past. I think the current administration would be better suited uh, uh, doing the G20 work they're doing with Vatu Devaya Kutumbakam and not worrying for a second about what the BBC documentary says. By banning it, by uh, uh, telling people not to watch it, you're giving it more oxygen. It's uh, self-hurting rather than, uh, it's, you're not protecting yourself. So this documentary is getting more oxygen than it deserves. Let but it wither away. With <laughs> it wouldn't probably. Well, we're giving it more oxygen by talking about it. I think if it had just come, shown, and forgot, it would have been forgotten, digested, done. But by, you know, satanic verses became a household name because it was banned. Mm -hmm. it, the Sharia law defied it. All of a sudden, um, Salman Rushdie became a household name. So we're doing the same thing with the documentary. You never ban things. Can you please say something bad about me? <laughs> I can become a household name. You don't want to become a household name because of being banned. No, kya fayda? I think the BBC um, is laughing their way to the bank. They've had a mediocre documentary get more oxygen than it deserves. So this is a, it, our Supreme Court has uh, acquitted the Prime Minister. Nobody needs to know more. It's done. It's a closed chapter. But Don't open it. What's your aspiration for this new and upcoming India? Like people my age. I think we have. If there's anything good coming out of, from this very polarized world globally, you use the word global, every country is being challenged by uh, uh, nationalism. And in this nationalism, especially in the US and Indian uh, uh, systems that I know well, if there's anything good that can come out of it, perhaps we'll see hyper-localized food, hyper-regional food, hyper-seasonal food, and with that, localized art, localized music, dance being celebrated. So in nationalism, there's a thin line between being nationalist and being jingoist. If we can remain nationalist and not turn into jingoism, we are safe. The minute we become jingoist, then we are we're digging our own grave. I, so I hope your generation of Indians are going towards a very uh, stoically sound, smart, and uh, globalized, globally sen uh, uh, sensitive nationalism that does everything soundly with national interest, but still thinks about its neighbors, the other, and the planet that we share with the world. I we have to do that. I feel honestly so honored to be sitting next to you. My college essay was actually on jingoism and nationalism and how we need to have the, you know, uh, distinction in our head. We need to be able to discern. And I think that's what's lacking, that discernment. I think our Indian voters are smart. Every time we've had our nation um, take wrong turns, the Indian voters have done very well. I think our, na our nation is very strong. I think even, uh, you know, there's this movie, Besharam Rang. No, yeah. not Besharam Rang. <laughs> Patan. Yeah. Patan. <laughs> and the Prime Minister uh, actually uh, impressed me when he said, stop talking about movies. <laughs> he said, let's become uh, people, politicians who are doing work for the country and not focus ourselves on silly things like a song. So I think if there's any benefit we can get out of movies and uh, about from nationalism, yeah. I hope we veer back to a centered way of thinking and living and loving and caring. 
बिकॉज यू नो हु वॉट इज इन इंडियन हम लोग सब भारतीय हैं हमारा एन सी सी का जो नेशनल एन सी सी का जो एंथम है कहता है हम सब भारतीय हैं अपनी मंजिल एक है हा 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 एक है हो 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 एक है कश्मीर की धरती प्यारी है सरताज हिमाला है सदियों से इसको हम अपने खून से पाला है बिखरे बिखरे तारे हैं हम लेकिन झिल में लेके समझ लें दैट हाउ ब्यूटिफुल इज दैट कि बिखरे बिखरे तारे हैं हम लेकिन झिलमिल एक हैं हम सब भारतीय हैं सो दिस इज आर कंट्री वी डोंट हैव टू वरी इफ वी अलाउ इंडिया टू शाइन नो बडी नो वेव ऑफ आइडियोलॉजी विल एवर टेक अस द रॉन्ग पाथ आई इफ यू बिलीव इन आर पीपल इफ यू बिलीव इन आर स्ट्रेंथ इफ यू बिलीव इन आर बेटर इंस्टिंग इंडिया विल ऑलवेज बी दैट माँ भारती दैट विल टीच द वर्ल्ड हैव टू बी केयरिंग मदर of human fraternity so let that india shine that the mother will lead all of us to the better places because india is not a macho nation we are a nation that mother ma bharati guides and ma bharati will not take us to wrong places i think last year you said that indians and as, as well as like um other countries we're all embracing mediocrity now and that it's become very prevalent that whether it be our culture whether it, whether it be our identity whether it be our food we're all like kind of comfortable in the mediocrity you know say that so elegantly okay i i, I can be elegant at times i guess <laughs> we are embracing mediocrity yeah i think in its human nature to be lethargic in um uh thinking it's easier to be dim it's easier to be uh, to make do smaller things why well, think of grand vision when you can make money doing something easy and uh, doable cheap and cheery uh, uh, but India has never been about that. As a young nation in the 1940s, our founding father, Prime Minister Nehru, and the leaders of that at the moment, they thought grandly. They thought big. They thought of an India that was uh, a partner to the world, not against the world. And luckily, all our leaders since have done this. And today, we are uh, we have the G20 leadership. So let's hope that India, which thought which thought beyond itself. that put its uh, feet in ahead of the chadar and hurt itself a little because it wanted to be one with the planet i hope that india keeps living mediocrity may be charming for 2 minutes but when you scratch the surface the ugliness comes out so think big work hard and be that indian that sweats for its nation sweats for the betterment of society that works hard to feed the stranger to give comfort to the person of another religion that open doors for the refugees coming from other countries that shows a guiding light to other nations that are struggling that shows through its own experiences and histories to all other countries that are called third world or developing how we one can become an independent a developed nation because india has the ability to guide others because india often chooses to do the right thing rather than the easy thing and i think that's what makes me love my country that we always do what's correct not what's easy so this any song comes to mind that you want to dedicate to our country you know it was gandhi ji's birthday yesterday on 30th january and it today is 31st i used to sing at the birla house for gandhi ji's birthday and death anniversary every year and one of the songs we sang was tum ram kaho ve rahim kahe dono ki garaz allah se hai tum deen kaho ve dharm kahe मन शा तो उसी की राह से है तुम इश्क कहो वे प्रेम कहे मतलब तो उसी की चाह से है तुम साले कहो वह लूला है मकसूद दिले आगाह से है क्यों लड़ता है मुँह रख बंदे ये तेरी खाम ख्याली है है पेड़ की जड़ तो एक वही हर मजहब एक एक डाली है द लास्ट पार्ट से क्यों लड़ता है मुँह रख बंदे ये तेरी खाम ख्याली है है पेड़ की जड़ तो एक वही हर मजहब एक एक डाली है गांधी जी इज फेवरेट सॉन्ग टीचिंग अस ऑल इज इंडियंस ऑफ ऑल कलर्स इंडिया इज अ रेनबो ऑफ फेंटास्टिक मैजिक एंड आर डिफरेंसेस मेक अस यूनाइट एज अ स्ट्रॉगर नेशन एंड दैट्स व्हाट गांधी जी रोमांस एंड ऑन दिस डे आफ्टर हिज एनिवर्सरी आई एम थिंकिंग ऑफ दैट सॉन्ग इट्स अ ब्यूटीफुल सॉन्ग एंड आई थिंक इंडिया स्टिल बिलीव्स इन इट सो आई हैव होप फॉर इंडिया बीइंग द लीडर ऑफ द वर्ल्ड because in the some of our uh, differences we become stronger in our wholesomeness 
and that's the magical India that can change the planet. And the way the planet is going in very polarized ways, India can still do it. That was beautiful. I think you've given me and everybody listening a lot to think about and to, you know, introspect on. Oh, that was amazing. It's India. I'm not that smart. I think my column uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, I wrote I was a straggler in school. I was never the first in class, never even want. I, don't, I have no bone in my body that uh, is competitive. I've never chased winning a star, Michelin star, first in class. My parents never pushed us. We didn't have it in us. What we chase is happiness. And uh, we use, I sleep three to four hours. Yesterday I slept a full seven hours. I don't know how. And, but I sleep happy at night because I've done things that don't hurt me and don't hurt others. I have broken dreams. I, have, I don't meet some of my expectations, but I'm not broken by them. And I think as a nation, we need to value that India because those lessons came, from, came to me from my grandparents, my neighbors, my school teachers, by my friends, their grandparents, their neighbors, and were reaffirmed by my parents. So all of India thought like that. And that India is a glorious India where you go to sleep happily knowing there's a tomorrow. And tomorrow, if you work hard, if you respect one another, if you care for all of humanity, life will be okay. You may not get your stars and you may not get that raise at work. You may have a child not get into the best school, but still goes to school and it's okay. India is not about absolutes. India lives in grace. The world lives in black and white. India lives in color, flashy color, bright, it's dull shades of greys and pinks and magentas and all the other colors of the world. That's where India shines. So I'm not any. Ex I'm not an extraordinary person. I'm the arm admi of India, and we all dream beautifully because we sing very happily with our heart, and that's the India we should chase after. And we'll all sleep happily and live tomorrow and day after with smiles on our faces. That was amazing, and I know you're very close to your mum. So let's just end the podcast with you telling us. One thing that she said that you would always remember. So my mum would always tell us, be charitable because what goes around comes around, destiny, karma. Um, and we would say, what does that mean? She said, you know, help people when you're able to and always. But don't help with any expectations. Help because it makes you feel good. Love because it makes you feel good. Give because it makes you feel good. Uh, be generous because it makes you feel good. Be patient because it makes you feel good. Be kind because it makes you feel good. Why? Because tomorrow when you need another to be kind, generous, patient and uh, charitable towards you, when you've done it to another, another will do it to a second, a third, a fifth, an eighth, a tenth, a hundredth and it will come back to you. So what you put out in this, earth, in this world, my mother told us, was like an echo chamber. You put out good, you'll get good. You are, you are like a conjuice with your love and affection and uh, generosity. The world will be conjuiced to you. So mom taught us to be big because we wanted others to be big to us in our times of need. So we must live by the golden rule. Do unto others as you want done to yourself. And that's what I remember from my mother quite clearly. Keep do for others, not because you want something, because that's the only way you want to live. And if you live that way, another will watch you and live that way. And a third and a hundred and a thousand. It will come back to just be pervasive in the world. The world is an echo chamber. Remember that. No one could have put it as beautifully and as eloquently as you have. No, really, it's, it will make so many of my people, people watching this think and hopefully expand their hearts. So, you know, this is a, there's a song there which came from the movie Earth, I believe. And from the trilogy Earth, Water and Fire, that Ishwar Allah tere jaha mein nafrat kyu hai jang hai kyu? Tera dil to itna bada hai, insa ka dil tang hai kyu? Wow. Goonj rahi hai, dard ki cheek hai, sari zami pe, that there's blood all over. In the last night, I'm forgetting, it says that, you know, the human heart has a key. Or a stalik me zang pad gaya hai. That tera dil to itna bada hai, insa ka dil tang hai kyu? Ki hum logo ke jo hearts hai, unme ek tala laga hua hai. Or tala me zang pad gaya hai. 
वी फोगॉटन कि हमारा हार्ट है उसके एक चाबी डाल दी है और चाबी में जंग लग गया है तो दिस इज वॉट वी बिकम सो द मिनट वी लव एंड वी लर्न वी हैव टू बी इलास्टिक दैट इज द की टू हैपीनेस देन अनरिक्वाइटेड लव ड हैपीन बिकॉज यू गॉन पास दैट You've gone. You're not loving to get back. Unconditionally, it's it's unconditional love because you're loving to love. You're not loving to be. Say, oh, you're beautiful. We don't give compliments to each other. When I see a gorgeous face, Gareeb, Rahees, doesn't matter. I laugh and smile. I give them a car. I say, "Wow, I, I, my eyes tell that person I find you beautiful." And they smile back and they say, "Thank you." That con- connection makes that person's day happen. But I said it because I mean it. We, we, but most of us want to compliment back. Oh, you look lovely, Hansika. Oh, Shivi, you look gorgeous too. That exchange doesn't need to happen. Yeah. When you want to give a compliment, give it irrespective of knowing whether the person will give it back. Yeah. I don't give it for Hansika to give me one back. I find you beautiful. I say it. It makes me happy that I said it. That is. That is how you have to live life, not to get something back. That is beautiful to live and love unconditionally. Because we don't have the ability. We are not God. That's not our. We can't change lives. We can only do what we can do. And be just like Savir Saran. No, <laughs> don't be. I'm as flawed as the best of them. So be like all the other great masters you have. It's very important to have idols that you uh, want to be like. Find them, and they don't have to be idols that are gods. They should be people who've struggled, who've uh, defied all their struggles, and still jumped up every day. You don't have to have idols that are successful billionaires. Uh, with awards and uh, be politicians or pandits or mullahs be like ordinary people who smile despite being punched every day by life find those idols and chase them and follow them and be like them very inspirational but you've given me so much to think about like i'll just be thinking about whatever you said all day luckily we are towards the end of the day yeah <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much for thank coming it's been an me. honor and a privilege thank, thank you, you so much for coming thank you for having me